Not long ago, you might have called it magic. Today, it's called CGI, Computer Generated Imagery. It's protected by magic. It's protected by magic. This electronic world of make-believe, where real animals talk and statues come alive, is revolutionizing Hollywood special effects. Super fast graphics computers, new creative software, and high resolution pictures are rapidly taking us to the point where audiences can't tell if it's real or CGI. Ow! Thank you. Today, we'll enter the mind of an effects wizard who helped start it all, Robert Abel. We'll see how he contributed to the development of an entire new art form built from bits and bytes of computer technology. And we'll explore the cutting edge of animation with computer artists who are advancing the possibilities of CGI. Come on, move it! Coming up, special effects from microprocessor to the big screen on Movie Magic. Great. This will be the tie-in. Right. Um, I feel like he's too far away from us. In the Disney movie Hocus Pocus, witches turn a boy into a cat. <coughs> but this is no ordinary feline. A faster, and I think we have it. Yeah. What the filmmakers sought to create was a compelling character with lifelike human qualities. The studio first came to us with, by the way, can you guys do talking animals? And I said, well, be a little more specific. He says, well, we have this character, it's a cat. Do you think you can make it talk? Bert Terreri is special effects supervisor at Rhythm and Hughes, one of Hollywood's top CGI studios. In its commercial work, the company has specialized in giving human emotions to inanimate objects. They've also created notable CGI effects in movies and television shows. Now get back up there! This otherworldly creature in Star Trek Deep Space Nine and this missile encounter in Flight of the Intruder were Rhythm and Hue's computer creations. But Hocus Pocus was the company's toughest challenge yet. The one thing is a cat can... it's almost like a frog. I mean, they can... You know, they can rotate, you know, they can almost point their ear. The producers of Hocus Pocus wanted something unique in the history of motion pictures. A completely believable, photorealistic, talking cat. To make an animal a character and not make it too much like animation, but at the same time give it expression, that's a challenge. That I enjoy. The challenge on this project is to create a lifelike, computer-generated cat head animate it with facial expressions, and then composite it onto the body of the real cat in the movie. A blending of live action and computer-generated imagery. Talking animals are nothing new to movies. Earlier techniques included rotoscope animation, like this talking dog. You mean about America's finest economy car? And Francis the talking mule was simply chewing peanut butter. My boy, Donald, has finally discovered S-E-X. Thank you. But some of the most believable animal action has been done using CGI. The first draft beers really haven't evolved. Some of it's real, some of it's not. We've replaced some of the whole heads of the chimpanzees. Excuse me, I'll have what he's having. It was actually the chimpanzees who finally talked Disney into hiring Rhythm and Hughes for Hocus Pocus. Or we can do a really active... Here they come! And we can get the cat to rear up, to rear up on his back legs and swing his arms. Or we can use the still cat... And... Here on the Disney soundstage, Terreri works with animation supervisor Chris Bailey to ensure that the live-action photography will work with the computer-generated cat's head. Can you make him not do the paw? No. We don't want the paw. 
No, I don't. I said I don't want that. Oh. I'm here to make sure. I essentially just get what I need for a dialogue shot. To make sure the shot's long enough. I try to get the cat looking in the general direction I want my cat to talk in. And so I'll take a stopwatch, and when the cat, as soon as I see a good starting point, I'll click the stopwatch, and I'll read the line of dialogue to myself. And as soon as the cat breaks away, I'll click and see if I have it. Like that could happen. Here they come, like that. Great. So we get here they come, and then the accent on come. Good. I like it. Or on we could do the whole thing on the way up too. Right. Excellent. Peter's happy. Excellent. Okay. Okay. Meanwhile, back at Rhythm and Hughes, modeling manager Keith Hunter works with a sculpted clay cat head modeled from photos of the live cats. He traces it into the computer using a special platform which surrounds the model in a magnetic field. What we do is we take our sculpture, put it on the stand, and put our wand wherever we want to put a point in the computer. The process, called digital encoding, takes thousands of points from the model and plots them on a sort of three-dimensional grid in the computer, assigning each a unique number. The computer keeps track of where each point is in relation to the others. And so what happens in the end is that we get a sculpture in the computer that looks like this real sculpture that's based on all the coordinates that we entered with this stylus within this magnetic field. The end result of Keith's work is a three-dimensional wireframe model of the cat head. This image is stored in the computer where animators like Colin Brady can now begin to manipulate it. It starts off as a as an actual sculpture and um, and then it's scanned into the computer digitized so this is uh, this is taken from a real sculpture and uh, connected you know cleaned up a little bit this is made up of 30,000 polygons little squares and triangles and with this I can zoom into any part you know if any changes need to be made or anything like that and as you can see the uh, resolution is pretty high this is just this is just a corner of the eye Using some of the most powerful graphics computers available, together with advanced imaging programs, Rhythm and Hughes is pushing forward the frontier of motion picture special effects. It's protected by magic. It's protected by magic. It's protected by magic. Computer-generated imagery was born in the 60s. It started with a crude line drawing technique called vector graphics. Used in 3D applications called computer-aided design and computer-aided mechanics, vectors were like electronic blueprints in 3D. In the beginning, they were used mostly for engineering, architectural work, and flight simulation. Pretty technical stuff, until young filmmakers like Robert Abel realized the artistic potential of this computer imagery. One of the first uses of vector graphics in film was when Disney asked Abel and Associates to create the title sequence for The Black Hole. I said, listen, I've got this vector flight simulator from Evans and Sutherland, and basically it allows me to move and the object to move in three dimension. So the best I could do would be the point of view of the computer of a rocket ship that was being pulled into a black hole. And uh, all of a sudden, I said, wow, there's a whole world there. In the 1970s, a new imaging system called raster graphics was developed. Where vectors are simple line drawings, raster allowed for full color, texture, shading, and lighting effects. The only drawback was that each frame took millions of computer calculations. In its early development, raster graphics required massive mainframe computers and weeks of painstaking work. Despite the limitations of this fledgling technology, Robert Abel continued to break new CGI ground. Developing their own programs and borrowing computer time from corporate giants like Bell Labs, Abel and Associates pushed computers to do more than even their designers could imagine. With a big-budget Super Bowl commercial called Brilliance, Abel and Associates forever changed the look of TV commercials. Yeah, because it kicks light up well, and that's another... Better known as the sexy robot, the spot called for a realistic robot with fluid human movements. This was an unheard of task for the computer programmers back in 1982, 
but Abel's team, led by CGI pioneer Randy Roberts, was up for the challenge. To, to get this type of a, a helmet on. How's that? That's pretty good. Um, okay, now the bottom lip looks a little thick. Maybe we should take... Can I translate them all up? Here? Yeah, what, maybe from like 25 to 34 or something. Okay, well, I think that looks better. The most difficult challenge was bringing the robot to life. Randy invented a technique he called brute force animation. The ABLE team filmed a live model and programmed her choreographed movements into the computer. The computer tracked reference points painted on her body. This data was used to create a vector graphic animated figure. I mean, it seems stupid at the time. I mean, she was in a barber's chair filled with all these black dots in a bathing suit, but it worked. The key to success was for the robot to appear organic, natural. It has to be something where you really can't tell if she's real or if she's computerized. Her movements are very human and she's very sexy but very strong. And you really, you've got to believe it's a human being and yet it isn't quite. Once we got the motion right, we used raster graphics to give the image form and color. The robot, her movements, the details, each reflection, the magic she does with the food, getting all of that into an environment and then adding Jupiter into the picture window. If you can imagine each picture of film, which is a 24th of a second, takes 10,000 or 20,000, add, multiply, subtracts, divides. Well, that's millions of bits of information that the computer has to chew through. In eight grueling weeks, this milestone of computer animation was complete. The art of CGI was greatly advanced, and the world of special effects would never be the same. After Sexy Robot, Abel and Associates went on to create some of the most stunning commercials ever seen. Winning 33 Clio Awards and two Emmys in the process, Abel's work helped popularize computer-generated imagery. In the 70s and early 80s, his company became a home to many of today's leading effects artists. The interesting thing about Bob Abel and Abel and Associates, where we all worked, is that that was the, the, like, the, the starting point of all this new stuff that we see today. He was like the first person to do it, and he was like the granddaddy of, of this sort of computer graphics. Uh, well, I worked at Robert Abel and Associates for about 11 years, and we did extremely creative work there. We were definitely at the cutting edge of, at, of motion graphics and computer graphics. In 1987, John Hughes and five other Abel alumni formed Rhythm and Hughes, where they've continued to push the technology toward new creative horizons. <laughs> As computing power expanded, other artists and technicians were making major strides in CGI. In the late 80s, a Northern California company named Pixar received an Academy Award nomination for its short film entitled Luxo Jr. I was inspired because one of the guys that, came, that I worked with came with his baby. And I thought, I wonder what a Luxo lamp would look like if it was a baby. And even though they were just lamps, I worked very hard on giving the feeling like this is a baby lamp and this is a parent lamp. They did the same action, but they do it, in, you know, it's one of the, the differences in character. With character animation, you try to create differences within the, the, the objects and characters. So I had them do the same object different ways. Founded in 1979 by George Lucas, Pixar hired Disney alumni and became one of the first companies to apply traditional animation criteria to CGI. So my background in character animation taught me one thing, and that is that the definition of character animation is not moving an object from point A to point B. The, defini the definition is to give life to. That's the essence of animation to me. Giving life to computer animation was an experimental, labor-intensive process. Pixar followed Luxo Jr. with Red's Dream, the story of a unicycle and a clown. But it was Tin Toy, produced in 1988, 
that became the first computer animation to win an Oscar for Best Animated Short Film. Well, we wanted a more challenging character. In some sense, the character was first, but in another sense, we had a whole new round of software that we had just developed. We wanted to do film to test out whether the software was any good, essentially. So we've tried to do these research vehicle kind of films uh, based on our tools and then grow our tools for, you know, to, to, to try to make better and better films. What's happening is computer animation is not, is not standing alone anymore. It's becoming invisible in the world of filmmaking. And I think that's the real exciting thing, is, is that it's being able to create things that you've never seen before, you know, and it looks so real and it blends in. Today, Bert Terreri and the Rhythm and Hughes CGI team are working with associate producer Jay Height and animation supervisor Chris Bailey to design a realistic, computer-generated cat head for the comedy fright film Hocus Pocus. And in a Hollywood first, they're blending that CGI head onto the body of a real cat in a way that will allow the cat to talk and act in a totally believable fashion. Phoenix, don't you think his head needs a little bit more room? Once the cat's close-ups have been chosen on the sound stage... Excellent. Okay. Okay. The film footage of the real cat is scanned into computers where the task of animating begins. Two for the it's handled for exactly like traditional animation. You have a voice tape, and you listen to it over and over again, and we animate the head. And when we get that moving with the right rhythm to the dialogue, then we go in and we start animating the eyes, no. and animating the ears, and animating the mouth for expression. Come on, move it! So this is the first thing we're starting with, which is the actual shot from the movie. And there's the cat doing a little pose. And there's a line of dialogue that we also have on the computer that I can listen to as he's moving on my headphones. And uh, so this is basically what we start with. And I'll just turn on um, computer model of the head. Uh, so that little green object here, these, this is the three-dimensional computer model that we put over top. And this is what we're animating. Uh, in this motion editor program that we have here. And you can see him saying his line. And it, his head is just moving pretty close to where the real cat's head is. But we're going to take out the cat's real head and put our computer head on top. So in this way, I can see it, you know, the way it's going to look in the real scene. Now this is my close-up of the face, and I can see the, the lips and the face moving around. It's protected by magic. It's protected by Again, magic. Again, that's in real time. It's protected by magic. And I can also step through frame by frame and match up real precisely to uh, what he's saying. Using the computer animation program, Les Major can give his cat a whole range of realistic, human-like expressions. We have things that are like little magnets that are floating around on the face, and they're centered on different areas, so I can move, uh, let's say I'm going to move this upper lip here. I'm just pulling his lip up into a sneer, but now he's sort of got a little snarl on his face. Originally, the animators tried to make their CGI cat as realistic as possible, but as Bert Terreri explains, the first version seemed a little too real. They have nice, long, pearly white teeth, and they come to a nice sharp point that I think if any of us have been bitten by one, know that, oh, they can puncture. Well, the studio felt that possibly that didn't connote a friendly cat. To solve that problem, Rhythm and Hughes simply used the CGI animation program to make the fangs a little smaller. We went through a little process of making the gums, making a tongue, and then shrinking the teeth down just a little bit. So it became not quite as objectionable to the studio. In the next step, the real cat head is cut out, digitally, of course. Then animator Rod Paul replaces it with the CGI head. The, one of the hard parts in this scene is blending in the fur, the computer graphic fur to the real fur. That part of the process, the texture mapping, 
is handled by Colin Brady. Extra onto that. In a sense, we peel off the cat's fur and map it on to the model. Then the head is there. Now that's without the eyes. The eyes and the whiskers are rendered separately. Then we start lighting the teeth, lighting the eyes twisting the ears to see if there needs to be nuances going on, whether the brows go too high, too low. From there, we go to high resolution, show it to the studio, and they say yes or no. That's the process. Yeah. Roll, please. Sweet. Pretty good. Pretty. It might take several weeks to get a shot looking right, but in the final product, moviegoers will have a tough time telling where the computer cat ends and the real one begins. Protected by magic. It's protected by magic. As computers get faster and costs come down, scenes like these that would have taken weeks in the early 80s are now being done in days. Soon the time frame will be condensed to mere hours. Most dangerous spells. She must not get it. From pioneers like Robert Abel to these young computer animators conjuring up tomorrow's images today, who knows what's next in the CGI universe? I don't know where the next break is going to be happened, but so far, you can't say it can't be done. CGI is taking the world of motion pictures and special effects into a new frontier, bounded only by the imagination of these CGI wizards who continue to amaze us with their own astonishing brand of movie magic. And there's more movie magic here on BBC Two at the same time tomorrow.